Working Preachers, it's Christmas. We know you are busy people. You have a lot of demands on your life. So we just wanted to take a special moment here to say, uh, we see you. We see you. We uh, are blessed by you. The church is blessed by you and the way in which you proclaim week in and week out the good news that we are hearing uh, this Christmas season, the good news of Jesus' presence and God's presence. So thank you so much. Yeah, and this year it's not even week in and week out. It's uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, uh, three days in a row for many of you uh, have services. And that's an, uh, a special w uh, experience of being worn out. I remember uh, my dad would often get sick right after Christmas just because of uh, uh, he's a pastor and getting worn down and your, uh, you know, your immune system is compromised. So thank you all for what you do. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Merry Christmas. Thank you for going through the year with us and for the year with your communities and your people. We appreciate you. And even if they don't take the time, uh, they're showing up year after year for those who are only on Christmas attenders or week after week. There's, that's an expression of gratitude. So we thank you for all that you do to make God's promise, presence, and peace made known. Uh, to the spheres of influence you have. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for December 24, Christmas Eve 2021, are Isaiah 9, 2 through 7, Psalm 96, Titus 2, 11 through 14, and then, of course, Luke 2, 1 through 14, and then we have brackets for 15 through 20. This is also, of course, the gospel reading for Christmas Day. So we're going to talk quite a bit, uh, recognizing that most of you or most of our preachers are going to be preaching on Christmas Eve. Christmas Day is uh, is is hit or miss there. So, but we have, of course, the Christmas gospel and how are we hearing this gospel this year? And, uh, and then we'll carry over a few thoughts into Christmas day. So do we get to ask what day it is, Caroline? Oh, that is a great question, Joy. I'm not what, gonna sing unless the guys join me. What day is it? <laughs> it's the it, feast of St. Caroline every year on the 24th. It is well, Christmas we have baby. To remember, it is Chris. It is Caroline's birthday. So Christmas Eve baby. You yes. get a podcast every year. The rest of us have to wait like once every seven years. <laughs> That's right. That's exactly right. So yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I was. Uh, yes, Christmas Eve baby, born in the morning, and I think my dad did church in the evening. So. <laughs> Yeah, but thank you. Yes, Christmas Eve is my birthday. Well, All I, right. so those asked, days, go ahead, Matt. I was just saying, you asked, you asked, how does this very, very familiar text touch home this year? And for me, it's, it, it's a line from uh, our friend Sarah Henrik's uh, commentary that, that helped me with that, where she says, heaven and earth meet in obscure places. Um, you know, let that be said clearly this night. And of course, we all know that, and we think of that with this text. But that's um, that's a message that I feel like I really need to hear coming up in two years of a pandemic. Uh, a lot of people I know in ministry or training for ministry really need to hear that as well, because people are exhausted uh, and they're really frustrated. And and peace on earth and goodwill to all. Uh, sounds really good for me and the people I like, uh, but I'm, I'm really frustrated at people who I know who still can't figure out how to get a mask over their nose, or I feel, you know, I'm frustrated by all sorts of things, uh, small and large, right, from that to the Supreme Court to everything in between, you know what I mean, we, everybody's the, the living online and living in relative isolation and living in frustration with the news cycle and all that stuff, I think is just cumulative. And so uh, I need to be reminded to look for places where heaven and earth are touching and, and unfamiliar places and in ways that benefit the people that I really am frustrated with. 
are the people that I think are making the world a worse place. So the people who I, you know what I mean? It, it's, there's a, we need to say it every Christmas Eve, but for me, that's particularly poignant this year. And that's where I would go if I were uh, in a pulpit on the 24th. I think one thing that is, and it, we get a hint of it in Sarah Henrik's commentary where she talks about the latter part of, of the lection 15 through 20, Mary pondered. She had received a direct call from Gabriel affirmed by the Holy Spirit through Elizabeth, her cousin. She has the promise. She has held the promised child in her arms and hears again from shepherds that he is the Messiah and the Lord. She, and then she treasures all of this and ponders them in her heart. And again, I, I talked about this last week. We have this image of Mary in this kind of um, passive sort of state of, 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 I don't know, looking up into heaven and thinking about all these things and reflecting and, and evaluating or whatever. But pondered is a really interesting verb. It is, uh, the verb is sumbalo. And balo means to throw in Greek and sum with. And so it's a, etymologically, it has this really, it has a sense to me anyway, this year <laughs> of all these things are being thrown together. And what do you do with them? Uh, what do you do with these, the, what's happened to her in the last, <laughs> in, in, these, in these last uh, days and in this last months and, and what is this going to mean going forward? And so it's not this sort of, uh, it's not this sort of sense of, of, of um, you know, sort of a silent reflection as it is so much as recognizing that, what do I do with all these things that have been thrown together that, that to what extent shouldn't have been or that are surpri surprising for sure. And so maybe it's an opportunity this year to sit in that pondering and recognize that the pondering is, and where we really are right now, of how many things have been thrown at us, thrown together over the last uh, 21, 22 months. And, and notice that she, she, it says pondered, but not solved. And so the way in which we can, and, and acknowledge that sort of not, I don't want to say violence, but uh, acknowledge a kind of friction there of things being uh, thrown together that, that to what extent we don't know what to do with, which, seem, which is, I think, certainly what Christmas should be about, uh, where you have, as you said, Matt, uh, the heaven and earth touching, and how is that possible? How is that happening? So recapturing some of the, some of the uh, just... Uh, radicalness of Christmas and the incarnation is what I, this verb is helping me realize this year. And some of that happens, some of that heaven and earth touching, obviously through her own agency. Like I, I'm struck by like the work she has to do. Like there's no mention of Joseph. There's no mention of family or friends present. We're not exactly sure where she is, probably in a cave in Bethlehem, you know, and, um, you know, she delivers the child, right? She gives birth. She wraps him in the bands of cloth. She's the one who lies, lays him in the manger. I mean, this is part of the, again, to over-romanticize this, part of this is her own agency in this work. Do you know what I mean? It's that, it, which is obviously deeply embodied, uh, but also, um, I don't know, her, it's, her activity is a big part of what's going on here and how it happens. This isn't, you know, the, the proto-evangelium of, of James, which describes the birth of Jesus, where there's this bright light and nobody can enter the cave, you know, it, there's something so ordinary about this. Um, and maybe that's where the pondering verb captures that, captures that agency or captures I think that. so. What in the world am I doing here in Bethlehem, having my baby? Yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's a lot thrown at her, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also found the commentary very rich uh, uh, and uh, uh, landing in the same way that I had just that, uh, Matt, as you described, the ordinariness of everything that's going on in our world. And then here, uh, this, open, this text opens up in the very ordinary 
uniqueness of what was going on in that ancient culture, giving it a place and a date and events around it. And then uh, to have Mary, uh, as you say, to, to have this agency. Um, and uh, I would want folks to, um, to be attentive to, uh, I, I think I like this being attentive to how she is looking forward and looking back, pondering in the midst of this, uh, as opposed to uh, getting caught up in what I would have done last year, uh, which was you know around the census because we were in a census at that time, or um, even uh, uh, trying to discuss what it what it means um, uh, to to figure out uh, you know. Just, just some of the things that we've always paid attention to in the text that um, are, are so familiar that we don't pay attention to what's in the text that challenges us to recognize the ordinariness of her world and God showing up in, in this newborn. And where is God showing up in the ordinariness of our world, which is just as disruptive, which is just as political, um, which uh, there, there are signs in the text of that political move or the political reality. Um, clearly there are signs in our own world of uh, the political realities, whether we're talking about uh, the things that are happening uh, in legislation, uh, the things that are happening uh, around the virus, the things that are happening, uh, um, uh, the violence that is taking, uh, taking place in the continued uh, shootings that are going on. Where's God? Um, can we ponder? Can we pause to see, to recognize, uh, as, um, as I think, Caroline, you talked about last week, to recognize the place where God does show up in, in ways that are familiar, if we look, um, just as this holiday uh, celebrating on Christmas Eve. We do this every year. It's a celebration, but we do this, why? We do this so that we can remember that in the midst of our brokenness, in the midst of our ordinariness, the creator of the universe intrudes and that intrusion is disruptive, but that disruption is good news. And, and how do we ponder that? My, my, my imagination is caught this year uh, by this text, uh, how the narrative uh, takes us on a journey from the center of the world and the center of power out to the fields. So it starts, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus. So you're in Rome. And then it takes us to then the center of the region, uh, Syria, where Quirinius is governor. And then Joseph uh, journeys from Nazareth to Judea, uh, and then eventually out to the fields where shepherds are keeping their watch over their flocks. So I, I really love that little narrative journey that, uh, uh, that Luke takes us on. And then there out in the field, suddenly the heavenly host bursts uh, into um, I don't know, I, you're, suddenly there was one angel shows up and then suddenly there is the whole multitude of the heavenly host. And just for issues of power, heavenly host means, uh, as Eugene Peterson always translates it in the uh, Old Testament, angel armies. Host here uh, is a military term, at least it is uh, in the um, Old Testament uh, version that this is, uh, but I think it is, it, that's what, I think that's what the Greek term means too. And then the intrusion of God into the world uh, takes place in vulnerability. It takes place in one who is born as a baby and is totally vulnerable and who will in eventually be tortured to death. So um, yes, God intrudes into the world at the least likely of places, far from the centers of power. And God does so in the most vulnerable way God could ever have uh, chosen to do so. And that intrusion has implications and uh, effects for all people. I think the other, the other connection I would make is we've heard this promise of 
Jesus' presence as Messiah, as Savior in this gospel already from John the Baptist in, and also in Elizabeth and Mary recognizing the, the vastness of what this, is, what this is going to mean, but particularly with John the Baptist, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And so the, that, narr that narrative flow that you're talking about, Rolf, of moving from the center of power, which you also got at the beginning of chapter three, and then in, but then into the wilderness, and here you have the center of power, and then into the fields, is that narrative reinforcement of, of what this birth is going to mean, and the impact it's going to have. And of course, that is for all, all flesh. And so the way in which that gets, that gets reinforced, and, and do we take that seriously? Do we recognize that, that the entirety <laughs> Of, of what we know is going to have is is going to be affected by uh, by the birth of Jesus. Are we looking at other texts? Would you like to? Well, I want to hear Isaiah nine read every single Sunday of the year. That's I, I would be happy with that. Why? Uh, partly it's because when this church is read in my own congregation every uh, every Christmas time, uh, it's always read well. <laughs> it's, <laughs> <laughs> uh you know especially verses four through seven um the, the the power of those images uh that are there this the the move from um from oppression to now um a a, a, a different kind of king who's ruling i mean it's just a if if the story from luke 2 gives us heaven and earth touching in the lives of uh, of a young pregnant woman uh, and um, and shepherds out in the field. Here it's at a national level. Here it's at a at a corporate level of what that looks like. This is a a bit of what Mary sung about last week in Luke chapter one. This is what it looks like. There are lives at stake when God throws down the mighty and raises up the lowly. Um, uh, there's destruction, old things have to get rid of, right? The old garments and the boots. I mean, those are symbols of power. Those are memories of, of bloodshed that are going to get burned for something new to emerge out. Of. I mean, it's just kind of, it, it pulls us into, I think, a more corporate, a more political way of understanding this, similar to how the Magnificat itself does in that interesting mixture of of personal experience, personal blessedness, things that only my eyes are able to see right now or my senses are able to perceive to now something that affects my neighbor, affects my, my future, affects what the next generations are going to live into. And, and you need both on Christmas, I think. And we particularly need that in the, in the darkness of the days that we are currently work, um, living in, to uh, be reminded that the light that comes will, will be peace. Um, it, it's, it's the wonderful counselor is, is both, uh, it can be both wisdom, but awesome awe, you know, the, the wonder, the, the, the fullness of that word. And, and there's a greatness to it and to, you know, as a, as a kid, Christmas is, was always that time that I looked forward to because of all the things that I was going to get. And, and you know, it was self-centered and, and all of that, but there was a charm to it. There was an awe to it. There was a wonder to it. There was an expectation to it. And um, can we recover that as adults? Can we recover that in this moment, in this time, in 2021, uh, as we are, you know, are preparing to end another year that has just been tumultuous? And then to have these words, um, like you said, Matt, read well for us again, that, um, that when God shows up, it's good, it's peace, it's awesome. Um, I, it, it, it turns all of the fighting we've been into into a gathered community um, who are experiencing hope. Um, uh, uh, let, me, let me say that better, that, that, that 
that it is the gathered community who has been experiencing hurts gathered now experiencing hope. And, and by saying experiencing, I mean, it's, it's not just the anticipation that we think of hope being, but it's actually the reception of the good, like a kid opening a Christmas gift. 